All right, this morning's message is called, Please Don't Deny Yourself. What? What? I mean, the Bible says to deny yourself. Jesus said to deny yourself. He said to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. So where is this coming from? Is it just out of left field? Is it all wrong? Well, I want you to consider this morning that as a New Testament Christian living on this side of the cross, living on this side of the resurrection, living on this side of Pentecost, because you are born of God, born of the Spirit, made new at the core, that you should not deny yourself. We're going to consider the possibility that much of what we have heard about the word self and about who we are and what we need to do with us might just need to be turned upside down. And maybe there's a deeper, greater truth that we need to hang on to and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So this morning, uh, you know, my goal is not to be controversial. My goal is, is, is to show what I believe is true from the scriptures, and it flies in the face of religion. It flies in the face of New Ageism. New Ageism says empty yourself and get rid of yourself and be filled with some other thing, some force. This is the opposite of that. This is you get to be you. You get to be who God created you to be. And there is no conflict with Jesus expressing himself. So as you and I walk away today, my heart's desire is that we see more fully. I know I've talked about it in the past, but this morning this entire message is dedicated to the simple idea that you can be yourself 100% and express Jesus at the very same time. And it's fun, and it's freeing, and it's real, and it's what is supposed to happen Otherwise, you're acting like somebody you're not. Otherwise, you're faking it, and we don't have to fake it. Here's the passage in question, Matthew chapter 16. Jesus says to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, with just a little dab of context here, do you see what Jesus is saying? Friends, this is about getting saved. This is about salvation. The people that need to deny themselves are unbelievers. How do we know this? We have already taken up our cross. We have already followed Jesus into death. Galatians chapter 2 says, I have been crucified with Christ. Past tense. Romans chapter 6 says, Our old self was crucified with him. Do you see that we as believers have already followed Jesus Christ into death? We have been crucified, buried, and raised. Look at what he says. Whoever loses his life will find it. I ask you this morning, have you found it? Have you found it or are you still looking for it? Isn't salvation the losing of your old life and the giving of a new life? That is, by definition, what eternal life is, the gift of God so that nobody can boast. And so at salvation, I make a choice and I say, this life is no life. I am willing to lose this life so that I can gain real life. And that is the decision each one of us makes in coming to Jesus for salvation. So do you see the hypocrisy? Do you see how the scripture has been twisted when we say no to the old life, we say yes to a new life, and then we run around telling Christians they need to deny the life that they have? 
You gave up on the old self, the old self crucified and buried. You became the new self, and now you're supposed to deny yourself, deny what God has recreated inside of you. That makes no sense. It is not the truth, and the gospel is better than that. We are not in danger of forfeiting our souls. We have already been saved. If we are in Christ, we are a new creation. Don't reject the new creation. Embrace who you are. God doesn't need to replace. He already did. He's not trying to replace. He wants to embrace, and He wants you to embrace who you are in Him. Amen? Here's a thought as we continue this morning. We believers try to deny ourselves because we don't know who we are in Christ. And do you realize that you aren't anyone else? That who you are in Christ is who you are? Who you were in Adam is who you were. In Adam is a nice little two-word prepositional phrase we tack on the end. I was in Adam. But who you were in Adam is who you were, plain and simple. There weren't two yous, that's just who you were. Who you are in Christ is not some special part of you. Who you are in Christ is who you are. There's only one you inside of there, inside of that suit that you're wearing, inside of that body that you run around with. There's one person, one self the new creation, the new self. We try to deny ourselves because we don't know who we are in Christ. Romans chapter 6 says this, If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died... He died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Now, I'm going to request that we keep that passage up there for just a few minutes as I talk about some of the highlights here. I want you to notice that he says this. We've died with Christ, and it's past tense, but it didn't stop there. This next phrase means you didn't get left as a spiritual corpse. You didn't get left in the grave. You didn't get left in the tomb. God carried you through crucifixion, but also into burial and also into resurrection so that today we live with Him. Sound familiar? Because I live, you also live. Christ is my life, the Bible tells us, right? Christ is our life. And so we also live with Him. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus died to sin. Now, I find that peculiar since He never committed one. Jesus died to sin, but He never committed a sin. So why would He need to die to sin? Wasn't He already holy and righteous and perfect and God? So why would he need to die to sin? Now, I understand why he died for sins. I'm not talking about why he died for our sins. I'm talking about why he died to sin in order to get that, that connection severed. Here's why. Because we were in him. And we needed to die to sin so that sin would not master us. Now, watch this. It says the death that he died to sin, he died how many times? Once. Now, I want you to also notice two words, even so. You see the, the words, even so, consider yourselves to be dead? That means in the same way. Okay, get this. In the same way, in the same manner, of the same type that Jesus had, you have. Of the same death, of the same event. So, how many times did Jesus die to sin? Once, even so, in the same way, you died to sin once. And so, here's what we take away from that. A temptation comes to my mind. It's a, it's a lustful thought. It's an ugly thought. It's a, it's a selfish thought because selfishness is of the flesh. 
And that thought starts coming toward me in my mind, and I have a choice. I can say, this is who I am, and this is what I'm about. Or I can say, I consider myself dead to that thought. Now, some average, typical religious teaching out there might say that you're dying to sin. I mean, they wouldn't put it like that, but they would say, now, with enough devotions, and if you do your quiet time enough, and if you go to church enough, and if you join enough groups, and if you do enough curriculums, and if you dedicate yourself and commit yourself, then eventually you will conquer or you will be able to conquer that thought. Now, Romans 6 is saying the opposite. I mean, this is radical stuff. Romans 6 is saying that at the moment that that thought hits your mind, victory is today, victory is now, Because you are already dead to that thought. You're not 80% dead to that thought. You're not 62% dead to that thought. You are 100% dead to that thought. There is no life in that thought. That thought won't work for you because you're new at the core. And so he says, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, again, not just the dead part. Did you notice the second half? Consider yourselves alive to God. Now, what's the topic of this morning? Because I've already, I've already forgotten. The topic of this morning is please don't deny yourself, right? And we are challenging the idea that Christians need to wake up every day and deny themselves. Well, look at this passage. It says, consider yourself alive to God. So if I'm alive to God, why am I denying that? If myself is alive to God, why am I denying myself? Now, I get it. When we say deny myself, everybody thinks of dessert, right? Your favorite dessert. Mine is tres leches over there at Abuelos. And sometimes, you know, I go and I deny myself, but most of the time I don't. (laughs) And we think of our favorite tasty treat and all that. But I'm talking about the morbid, ugly, awful view that Christians need to get out of the way so that it can be all God and none of us get ourselves down we must decrease he must increase deny ourselves get rid of ourselves die to self all that stuff is nonsense I can't put it any plainer it is just nonsense and it is disrespectful to how beautiful the gospel is Christians get to be themselves and express Jesus at the same time. That is amazing. Is that not incredible? And so consider yourselves alive to God. Then when the thought comes knocking, here comes sin. Don't let sin reign. Who should reign? You say, Jesus! And everybody gets up and shouts, and that is 100% true. Let Jesus reign now and forevermore. But in context here, who's reigning? I mean, it's Jesus, and it's my new self, and it's Jesus, and it's myself, and it's my, my new man, and my new creation, and the person that got crucified, buried, and raised, and it's Jesus, and it's me, and it's Je- I'm united with Christ. It's a team. We're together. And so your heart reigns. When you choose to say no to sin, your heart is reigning. We talk about quenching the spirit. Don't quench yourself. Let your new self reign. Let who Jesus has made you shine because you are beautiful. You're a new creation and that's real. All right, well, what about the idea of laying aside the old and putting on the new? Many of us have heard, all right, I I knew in one sense, but I got to lay aside the old self and put on the new self and You know, but I am new. Yeah, yeah, I've been crucified with Christ. Old self crucified, Romans 6, Galatians 2. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have gone. But I still got to lay aside and put on because it's true, but it's not true, but it's true, but it's not true. That's fun. Good luck with that. So it's true, but it's not true, but it's true, but it's not true. Uh, I've tried that. Maybe you have. It doesn't work uh, because you don't know what's true. (laughs) All right, so what about laying aside of the old and putting on the new? 
Look at Ephesians chapter 4. This is where we get this idea from, I believe. Uh, It says in the middle of this passage, it says, you lay aside the old self. And then it says, and put on the new self. Do you see those phrases? Lay aside the old self and put on the new self. But I want you to back up and get a little context here and notice what Paul is saying. He's saying, here's what you learned. You learned to do that. When did you learn to do that? When the gospel was preached, you learned to do that. That you were going to lay aside an old life and you were going to put on a new life. Watch this. You did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now, I'll tell you why people have sort of twisted this into something that we need to wake up and do every day. Partly, I think, it's because when a a Bible expositor, when a teacher, a pastor, a leader gets up to present on this passage, they notice that the uh, verb tenses for lay aside and put on, they have no tense. Get this, they have no tense. So they're neutral, they're time neutral. I mean, lay aside and put on, uh, they have no time reference to them. So it'd be like if I got up here and I just started spouting off infinitives. To eat, to sleep, to drink, to drive. There's no time reference there. That's not past or present or future. It's just an infinitive. And so that's what these are. They're infinitives. They're neutral. So you say, well, what do I do with a neutral infinitive to find the time period that Paul is talking about? Help me out, Paul, would you? And all you have to do is look at the previous sentence. And he's talking about what they did learn, past tense, and did not learn, past tense, when they heard him and when they were taught in him. And so this is about the conclusion that they came to when the gospel was preached. I heard the gospel, one of them might say, I heard the gospel and I heard it so clear that I've got a current manner of life. I've got my old self and a current manner of life and it's truly death and there's no fulfillment in it and there's no joy in it and there's no Jesus in it. So what Brother Paul is telling me here is that I need to lay aside that former manner of life, lay aside that old self and turn to Jesus and say, save me, crucify me with you, bury me, show me a new way of living, raise me up into newness of life so that I can put on a new self. And that's what happened to every single one of us at salvation. Now, of course, there's renewing of the mind. That's mentioned in here. That's a process. We're learning and we're growing. But let's test this a little bit further because infinitives, verbs with no time, could be iffy, could be either way. Here's Colossians chapter 3 and thank the Lord for Colossians 3 because it just clears everything up. Look at this. Same apostle, same author, same language, laying aside, putting off, putting on. He says, do not lie to one another since you laid aside, past tense, laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, past tense, who is being renewed in what? Knowledge, renewing of the mind. Don't need a new heart, got one. Don't need a new spirit, got one. Don't need a new life, got one. Gave up on the old life, got new life. Don't need a new heart, a new spirit, a new life but I do need to learn and grow in the true knowledge of God. Do you see what this means for yourself this morning? Do you see what this means that there's nothing wrong with you? Yeah, there's some stuff wrong with the way we think sometimes, but you're not the sum total of what you think. You got a new heart, a new spirit. You're one with Jesus. You're the new self. He goes on, he says, put on, what do we need to put on? A heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Lastly, he says, put on love. That's like getting dressed. I mean, we all got dressed this morning and thank God for that. We all got dressed this morning and picked certain things, a shirt, 
a pair of pants, some socks, hopefully underwear. And we, we set out with something put on. And we wear clothes that fit for the most part, right? I've seen some of you. <laughs> but we wear clothes that fit and we wear clothes that look good on us generally, right? And so that's what this passage is about. I mean, who are we? And then therefore, how do we dress? Who are we doesn't need to change. Who we are is not being fixed. It's just the putting on of stuff that matches, right? I mean, this morning I tried a little bit to match. I don't know if I accomplished it, but I've got the blue and the white, and then I've got a soft gray. <laughs> but you know, we make attempts to match. And that's what Paul is saying. Will you let your attitude match your heart? Will you let your actions match who you are? And if not, you're going to experience a conflict. Have you ever worn something that's just too tight? And maybe you're hoping at the event you won't have to sit down, right? You're hoping that you can just walk your way through the evening because if you sit, there's going to be a split, <laughs> right? And when you wear stuff that doesn't fit, man, it's awkward. And when we put on envy and when we put on lust and when we put on um, anger and when we put on hostility, we put on division and factions, it's an awkward fit. We can do it, but it's an awkward fit. So, do you see what we're saying this morning? Don't deny yourself. Yourself is beautiful. Don't deny yourself. You're a perfect fit with Jesus. Don't deny yourself. You're a new self, and there's only one self in there. All right, well, what about this passage, lovers of self? 2 Timothy chapter 3, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Are you a lover of God? Are you a lover of God? Yes. Yeah, well, then you're reading somebody else's mail here. This is somebody else's description because Ephesians chapter 6 says you have that undying love for Jesus Christ. If you're a believer, you got a new heart that loves God. You are a lover of God, not a hater of God. And so, do you see who this is about? Lovers of self. They're loving the old self. They're loving themselves as unbelievers. And for that reason, they won't give up their life, forfeit their soul in order to get a new life in Jesus. Exactly what the Son of God was telling us in Matthew. These guys are digging in their heels at that invitation. And they're saying, no way, I'm good. No way, I'm fine. I've got, I've got my money and I've got my gossiping. And I've got my uh, ungratefulness that I love to wallow in. And I'm not giving it up, man. And these are unbelievers. So I guess there's uh, two reasons I brought this passage into play this morning. I mean, should we love ourselves? Now, I know that's two-sided. That's what I mean by two things here. We shouldn't dislike who we are because who we are is a new creation. And we should love who God has made us. We shouldn't depend on ourselves because the new creation is designed, get it, designed to be dependent on Jesus. So I'm the new self and I'm holy and I'm righteous and I'm blameless, but I'm the source of nothing. I am holy and righteous and blameless, but I am not the source Jesus is the source, and so we're put together so that I can depend on Him and fully fit with Him. So we can love our new self. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for whom you've made me. Thank you that I'm not a dirty worm. I'm not distant and dirty. I don't have to play this game of shoving myself down. Thank you that I get to be at the table. I get to be in the party. I get to participate. Thank you that I get to be myself 
and express your son at the same time. And so we can love who we are and we can be fully dependent on Jesus at the same time. All right, well, what about selfishness? Because, you know, people hear, okay, I'm supposed to believe I've got the new self. I'm supposed to believe that, uh, you know, myself is okay. I don't need to deny myself. But what about selfishness? Well, the new self is not selfish. I mean, if God recreated you and, and implanted a heart inside of you, do you believe he gave you a selfish heart? He said in Romans 6 that you've become obedient from the heart. So you got a loving heart, a kind heart, a forgiving heart. That's why all the time people call into the radio broadcast, they got a problem with somebody, and they're calling in because their heart is longing to reconcile and get this thing fixed. And man, when we talk about forgiveness, they, just, they, don't, they typically don't say, ah, oh, he, he doesn't deserve, I'm not going to. They typically are like, oh, yes, this is, this is what I needed. I needed to let this go. I needed to let this go. It was controlling me, and I don't want to act this way. And that is the new heart that is a soft heart, a forgiving heart, the new self that is a forgiving person in Jesus Christ. What about selfishness? That's of the flesh. The flesh is selfish. The new self is not selfish. What about self-control? Well, the new self is designed to be controlled or inspired by the Holy Spirit. Remember, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit control unbelievers? No. No. And so, in order for the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control, to be in my life, I got to be the new self. Because the Holy Spirit controls the new self. The Holy Spirit inspires and motivates and animates the new self not an old self. So I got to know who I am in order to really be dependent without crushing my own identity and shoving it in the corner. All right, finer thoughts. Amen. <laughs> Final thoughts. I hope your heart's crying out too, huh? Second Peter chapter 1, supply moral excellence and then a whole host of qualities Knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten what? Having forgotten his purification from his former sins, he still thinks he's his old self. See, he doesn't know his purification. She still thinks that she's a gossip. You're not a gossip. You're a child of God with a gossiping problem. There's a difference. There really is a difference because if you're a gossip, gossips are made to gossip. So keep gossiping until you're not a gossip because otherwise you're a hypocrite and a gossip. Do you follow that, anybody? If you're a gossip, then gossip. Because if you're a gossip and not gossiping, then you're a hypocrite. Be yourself. You see, God has not called us to fake it and act like a hypocrite. He has not said, you're a gossip, but please stop gossiping. He has said, you're a child of God with a non-gossip heart, with a non-gossip spirit, with a non-gossip identity. You love people at the core, therefore act like it. And we go, whoa, well, if that's true, then gossip doesn't fit. Oh, he's not asking me to fake it. He's telling me to be myself. Count myself alive to love and dead to gossip. He who lacks these qualities has forgotten his purification. So I want you to see two things here. The underlying part, look, it's about knowing Jesus and then it's about remembering your purification. Those are not in conflict. Know Jesus, the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and knowing your purification. You are not Jesus. You'll never be Jesus. But you are compatible with Jesus. So know Him and know your purification at the same time. They fit perfectly. 
All right, last thing I want to see today. Prove yourselves doers of the word. How many people have said, oh, grace is good, grace is good, but we got to be doers of the word, doers. He says, prove yourselves doers, not merely hearers. Anyone who is a hearer of the word and not a doer, look at what their problem is. Pay close attention here. This is the last thought of the day. Pay close attention to this dude's problem. He is not a doer. This dude is not a doer, and here's why. He is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, for once he's looked at himself and gone away, he has forgotten what kind of person he was. So what's the answer? Remember what kind of person you are. Don't deny yourself. Remember yourself. Don't get rid of yourself. Recognize yourself. And if you forget, go back to the mirror of the Word of God and say, Lord Jesus Christ, who am I? And you know what he'll say? He'll say, you are the righteousness of God. You are holy and you are a slave of righteousness. You can't get away from it. That is your destiny. You can delay it with some attitudes and actions, but you're going to hate it. If you delay it, you're going to hate it because you're a slave of righteousness. You can't escape. New heart, new spirit, new self. Conclusion. Trusting in our union and compatibility with Jesus Christ may be the most challenging and the most freeing aspect of the new covenant. I got to tell you guys, this means the world to me. That God, I could say God loves me over and over. I could quote John 3.16. I could spout off Bible verses about the love of God all day long. But if somebody loves you and then you don't get to be yourself, that is manipulation. If somebody loves you but you don't get to be yourself, they are muzzling who you are. And that is not the love of God. New Age says empty yourself. Religion says beat yourself down. God says be yourself because you're the new self. Please don't deny yourself. Count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the chance just to wake up every day and not have to rethink ourselves, not have to fix ourselves, not have to change ourselves, not have to walk on eggshells around you, but that we just get to be us and express Jesus at the same time. We grew up saying, I want to be more like Jesus. We sang songs, make me more like Jesus. We stood around campfires at camps and said, I just wish I could be more like Jesus. And we tossed our sins into the fire, tears streaming down our face, hoping that one day we'd be like Jesus. Father, we just ask today that you would show us we are like him as he is, so also are we in this world. New heart, new nature, new spirit, new creation, united with him. Father, show us how simple it is that we're slaves of righteousness, so we're free. We're slaves of righteousness, so we're free to be ourselves. It's safe. We thank you, Father, for Jesus, for the cross, for the resurrection, for all that it means for us. In your name we pray. Amen.